it actually it messes up the whole women's hormonal system, doesn't it? They probably don't teach it. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, any operation is, uh, you, you, I mean, you have to think again and again before doing any operation. If there's, well, you don't, but you should do because it, it's, you know, it's it's a violent act. It's, it's a very heavy thing for the whole body. So, of course, in the gross system of Western medicine, they, they just, especially because you make lots of money doing operations, so they always like that, bit, but actually it, it should be a last resort only. Because it's, it's very heavy, for even a minor operation, it's very debilitating. Plus we are also told that it's a woman than two or three, she has conceived two or three years with more than two instructions. Then we can, to protect the mother during uh, the process of delivery, and to fight this, we can kill one of the... Really? So that the other will be... No, is that, that's uh, illegal, surely. Yeah. But they, they, it's being done in our hospital and a lot of hospitals. So that's oh, really? But it must be illegal. It's, it's even according to their law. It's it's, no, it's, it's legal to because the three fetuses and uh, you can kill one so that other two so will other grow up. They will grow up. because they're competing for the same. And then they only get six children because they're taking drugs, which is another <laughs> unnatural thing. Yes. Yeah. They they overdosed or something on the fertility drugs. How does it happen? By overdose or just yeah. instead? So the drug it happens in the It's all nonsense. But you decide it's just another name for abortion. Well, whatever they may teach you, it's still sinful. <laughs> However much they teach you that it's good, it's good for society, Good for society. Have let to have less people. Why don't you cut your own throat? Tell them. <laughs> Ask them. If you think it's good for society, have less children. Why don't you do the uh, Kansas policy or Herod's policy and go around kill all kill all the children less than six months old? And they say it's good for society to have less children. Very simple. Very, very simple. <laughs> Hare well, blessings, you see, you can say blessings, blessings, but you have to do your own work also. You have to chant, you have to follow the principles, you have to study Prabhupada's books. It's not just you say blessings and all of a sudden... Blessings means the good wishes that you... you you take it up seriously, but that you have to do also. You have to do your own work also. Just that you can't become a doctor just for the death. The doctor will give you a blessing and then you also become a doctor. All right, he may give you, I, I, I hope you become a good doctor. They may say to you, but you, will, you have to work, to do your work. So blessings, you can take some books. Yeah. You can take books, you can take CDs, you can take the holy name. Yeah. Sorry? Who's that? She? Your sister. Your sister. Krishna is the Supreme Lord. He has one thing to do and everyone else has something else to do. 
he is to be worshipped and everyone else is to worship him. But he is also humble, as required. As required, he cuts off demons' heads and as required, he washes his own devotees' feet. The job of, or the, or the duty of every jiva is to serve Krishna and the duty of Krishna is to overlord everyone else. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he showed humility. As Hanuman showed humility by burning Lanka, that was his humility. To show the, the greatness of Lord Ram, that Ravana should not that Ravana should not be allowed to get away with his rascal dham unchallenged. So, uh, to show his absolute submission to Lord Ram, Hanuman burned Lanka. That is his humility. Simply groveling at people's feet, that's not humility. To uh, what people in the, what materialistic people call humility is, is a show of sycophancy, to gain, to gain some advantage from others. Actual humility means to serve the Vaishnavas by all means necessary. They don't know. They need, a, they need to be taught what is the meaning of humility. I also had a question. Hmm. It said uh, that uh, a poor devotee is like a touchstone. Hmm. So whoever comes in contact with a poor devotee immediately uh, imbibes the mood of Krishna consciousness. They may do. It depends on their receptivity also. So if they're not receptive enough, uh, no, some people they become offensive in the presence of pure devotees. He can give Krishna consciousness to others, but and it may be that by his association people are not interested in Krishna consciousness become inspired to do so. But we see just like Prabhupada who's traveling all over the world, not everyone took it up. The effect of his association will help them. It may not manifest immediately, but it certainly help them. Uh, empowered devotees, they can change people who are even not interested in Krishna consciousness. But it doesn't mean that uh, necessarily that everyone who comes in contact with them will immediately take up Krishna consciousness. We see with Prabhupada, many people took up Krishna consciousness by his direct association. Many are even today by reading his books. But not everyone does. It depends also on the individual. It depends on individuals' consciousness? Yeah, it depends on their willingness to take it also. Some people are very resistant. Some people manifest their resistance not by active resistance, but by passive resistance. They simply ignore it. And if somebody is mentally offensive to a devotee, does that count them to No, but the, the thing is, if, if you harbor bad thoughts, they generally tend to manifest in a more gross way, gradually. So it's not good to to harbor bad thoughts because eventually it will come out in speech or in action. So although sinful thoughts are not punishable in Kali Yoga, still it's not good to to nourish them. You think, don't say, I, well, I, I can get away with it, so let me think all bad things. It's not, it's not advisable at all. It means that due to some uh, past bad way of thinking, some bad thought may come in the mind. So one is not punished for that. And then you should throw it out. Don't nourish it. Don't, don't give it fuel. Don't think, oh yes, that's true. Krishna is the controller, so it's like people come in contact with devotees, still they are fortunate, not fortunate enough to... Krishna is the controller, but he gives little independence to everyone, to choose to serve him or not. We control, but we have a little independence. We can't control. For instance, 
you didn't choose to be born in that particular body that you're born in now. You might have wanted it to be, you know, people get plastic surgery. You know, if they didn't want their nose too long and bumpy, they might want to go to a plastic surgeon and get it sorted out. So, we didn't... Krishna controls three modes of material nature, but there's some independence everyone has to choose to serve him or not. We get a certain situation, but within that we can act in certain ways. Just like if you get on a plane to go from Bangalore to Bangalore, within the plane you can choose to sit and sleep, or you can read a newspaper, or you can talk to the person next to you. You have some choice, but you don't have a choice to get off the plane when it's in mid-flight. So you have certain measure of independence. So Krishna could force us to act in a manner that's beneficial for us, but then there would be no choice, and then there would be no question of love. Krishna could manufacture a bunch of robots to do whatever Krishna wants, but that there be no love. Love means voluntarily acting in a manner that's pleasing to Krishna. Right? So we have a little independence, Krishna gives that. We can choose to serve him or not. So does it to some extent depend upon our previous births, how much involvement have we are? Yes. Generally that's so. It's a, it's a progression that continues from previous births. Generally it's so. Although maybe, it, see at some point someone has to begin, so someone may be just beginning. And someone may even, without any background of pious activity or devotional activities in previous lives, they may just take it up just like that. Especially that's possible by the touchstone effect of a great devotee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Prabhu Bhatti, it's written that at the time of death, if you are thinking of Krishna... Yeah, that's in Bhagavad Gita. It's, yeah. Prabhupada is so explained in Bhagavad Gita. If a person has been bad throughout his life, he is not a devotee. Then generally they won't think of Krishna. Obviously, uh, you, you, what you do, at the time of death, your consciousness reflects everything you've done throughout life. That's why, that's why in the same chapter in which Krishna describes that uh, what we do at the time of death, that, or our consciousness at the time of death, determines our next birth, that's why he advises that throughout life we practice cultivating Krishna consciousness. So that at the time of death we can think of Krishna. Otherwise, not going to be possible. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's not some blind sentiment. We have to cultivate it. And at the end of life, then we can think of Krishna. Or even, because Krishna is very kind, even if due to the... there's a great disturbance in the body and mind at the time of death, even if we don't think of Krishna, Krishna will still take us to him if we've seriously cultivated Krishna consciousness, or Krishna will come in our minds. Krishna will help us. So please cultivate Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. Um, next month? When are you going to go? Hmm? Ah, yeah. When are you going to So I may see you there. You ca I can't remember the date exactly. I think it's uh, 40, about the 11th, I think I'm going. And then 14th and 15th, I believe it is, we're going to take all the bodies to Kanchi. And like that. For a Saturday, Sunday. So please come. Enjoy the heat of Velour in June. And chant Hare Krishna. Are you, do you know our center there in Vela? You visited there? In uh, Gandhi Nagar, actually. Yeah, you can ask more questions. When you say that you belong to the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, so what exactly does that mean?
<laughs> Good question. What do you mean? What exactly does it mean? Because uh, we just, you just wrote in the lecture that Madhya Acharya and Chaitanya. Yeah, we, we claim, uh, the, the Gorya Vaishnava Sampradaya is claimed to derive from Madhva Acharya. Although actually the Madhva teachings and the Gorya teachings, there are significant differences. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sampradaya is, we count it within the Madhva, within the Madhva Sampradaya. Because uh, Madhavendra Puri, who was the grandma, grand spiritual master of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is uh, accepted to be a disciple of Lakshmi Pati Tirta, who is coming in the Madhva Sampradaya. And because of uh, because that reason I gave, that, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very much appreciated Madhva Acharya's total refutation of this Mayava, which is actually the complete antithesis of bhakti, completely destroys bhakti. Even there are people who they're doing, supposedly doing bhakti, but if they have this idea that that I am the same as God or ultimately we all become God, it's, it's not bhakti at all. It destroys bhakti. It has to be totally thrown out. Otherwise there's no question of bhakti. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appreciated Madhvacharya's total refutation of Mayavad. Anyone who's not totally opposed to Mayavad cannot even begin to enter bhakti. If anyone has any sympathy for it, then there's, there's no question of them actually doing anything pleasing to Krishna. Yeah, yeah. Well, we do, if we do. It's not just a matter of saying it. But we have to belong uh, formally and intentionally. Formally means that one is officially accepted as a member of the Sampradaya by initiation. But then the, the, that's the... That is a formality which is... Uh, you could say that is fulfilled or substantiated by our serious commitment to practicing Krishna consciousness. Why is Kali Yuga so bad? Kali Yuga is an arrangement for all the sinful people to come together and harass each other. Because we want to be, because we have such sinful desires, we are born in the Kali Yuga and we harass each other. I, I, and it may be also that some people are very pious, they also get born in Kali Yuga. Those who are getting the opportunity to take part in the Sankirtan movement. Why is the cycle? It's an arrangement of the Supreme Lord to facilitate various uh, sinful various levels of sinful desires of conditioned soul. It's, it's a good arrangement. You think of a better one, I doubt it. It's made by Bhagavan himself. It's practical. Persons of certain mentalities are grouped together at certain times. About the scientific things, when we discuss with our friends, they say that why not human skeletons are found in dinosaur age? Why not? What happened? Why is it Well, one thing is that civilized people burn bodies. That's one thing. This, all this skeleton remains, that's all 
you see, even nowadays, what they used to talk about this Neanderthal man, but you can find men today who look like what's called Neanderthal man. I know one of my teachers at school, we used to call him Neanderthal man, because he had a... <laughs> he looked like that, exactly. I mean, there's so many, uh, there's so many mis mistakes in the... Uh, it's a whole thing, it's just... You're all fools. You think that you think it's being scientific to believe these so-called scientists. They don't know what they're talking about. All the time, all the time, they're finding so-called fossil records, which completely changes the dates of their of their speculations. What you're taught at school is basically a bunch of what's called in America bullshit. It's an expressive term. It's quite suitable for almost all of what you're taught in school. People are fools. They believe it. They think they're educated because they believe. I ask them, why do you have faith? And they say, well, the scientists, well, why do you believe them? You haven't done it. You, it's just your faith. You just believe them because they say, you didn't go and do any experiments or dig up any skeletons. You just believe them. You just, you're just blind faith. They all have so many different opinions. Tell them they just have blind faith. Because these people call it science, you have blind faith in it. Tell them they never intelligently try to understand the actual purpose of life. They just have blind faith because someone says something, they believe it, that's all. You can tell them for sure that whatever they learned in school is already not accept, accepted by mainstream science because they always teach what was, what was accepted 20 years ago. And by the time, it, by the time they change it to the, uh, like the present theory, already it's 20 years out of date. They're always 20 years behind the so-called scientific truth. So whatever they're teaching you is not what's taught what, not what scientists believe now, which is always changing anyway, which is not knowledge, because it's always changing. If it was knowledge, then what you were taught at school should be what they'll taught, teach in school 20 years later, but they won't. It'll be something different. Tell them to go back 20 years later and see if they teach the same thing. It won't be the same thing. So it's not science at all. It's what, what they call science is just belief, that's all based on someone looks at something, makes some speculations, and other people believe it, and it's called science. And then someone else comes along and shows something else, which refutes that, and then they call that science. And then someone comes along and shows that what he says is, is wrong, and gives something else, and they say, oh, this is correct, and they call that science. And it goes on like this. People want to be cheated. You can read Srila Prabhupada's Life Comes From Life. Did you read that? I yeah, read that. Tell them to read that. Think positive. Your t-shirt says, think positive. What does that mean? HIV? <laughs> think positive. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to have lots of miseries in life. It's true. Think positively about it. You're going to die. <laughs> 
What is there to think positively about this material world? It's just another trick. To, this, this positive thinking is just another trick to make you work like an ass. Naturally, you don't want to work like an ass, but they tell you, think positive, and then, okay. Think positive, and then you, then you work like an ass, because you're thinking positively. You're a positive ass. I'll be a success. Work hard. Okay, well, I guess I came here to sign some books. I signed two or three, and if no one else... Want to say something? I have a question. So, the, my friend asked me, why not eat non-vegetarian? Because if an animal also has a soul, even the plants have the soul. So it's like killing a person who cannot speak in Hindi. So it's no crime. And then I said, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, offer flower, water, and yeah, 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 yeah. seed. So if that is what I don't believe, you in the lecture said that you cannot just believe, there should be a science. All right, okay, so I'll give you a, a, a reasonable answer to this. First thing is, a lot of vegetarian food uh, doesn't involve killing at all. Just like grains are harvested after the plant is already dead. Right, you know that? Have you ever seen grains in a field? When it's yellow and dried up, then it's harvested. So there's no, in rice, in wheat, in ragi or whatever, there's no killing involved. In uh, fruit, taking fruit from trees, uh, there's no killing involved. In taking milk from the cow, there's no killing involved. There is, in some vegetables, there is killing involved. Uh, so it's sinful. But, and in fact, even taking the grains, it's, everything we do is sinful if we, if we don't do it for, the, for serving Krishna. So it is sinful, but at the same time, it's not... Killing a potato is not as sinful as killing a cow, because the cow has more developed consciousness and has, a, has, a, has an acute sense of suffering when you kill it. So there, it is more sinful to kill a cow than to kill a potato. However, one is absolved from all sins and purified by taking food that is offered to Krishna. Because Krishna says that. He is the maker of everything and he says that if one offers me food with love, I accept it and I absolve everyone from sins. So, it's not the same. Killing a cow and killing a potato isn't the same. Most vegetarian food is, doesn't involve any killing anyway. Killing or not killing, it's, uh, it, there is some, at least, modicum of sin involved in it. But if we offer everything to Krishna, then no sin. But Krishna doesn't need meat. So we have to offer him what we call vegetarian food. So there's the uh, scientific reply. You can tell that person. Hare Krishna.